world glory. Mm, I feel his presence here. Hallelujah. Mm. Well, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord today. We love you. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. I learned an interesting statistic uh, this past week. There are over 1,400 men mentioned in the Bible. There are 111 women. I've come to the conclusion. God in his sovereignty understood he could do a whole lot more with a whole lot less when he used women. Huh? They could get things done. He didn't need to have 1,400 women. 111, he could get everything done he wanted done. Now, we guys, he probably had to push us along a little bit. Okay? He had to try to get us. I am so grateful for what God is doing. We want these moms to continue in prayer. It's a great, great time. Amen. Today, I want to also share that, you know, I get this opportunity and because I'm right here, and uh, I'm grateful. I just want to tell you, I'm grateful for my mom, and uh, I love her, and I think she has been just an example, an icon of faithfulness and dedication. And uh, I mean, for the 19 years I've been alive, she's been a great mom, and I'm grateful for that. Amen. Amen. And, and my daughter is squinting at me. Okay. And so. The first service, Brother A.J. was coming and putting it in, and I made that statement, and he actually laughed out loud. <laughs> okay, no, for 58 years almost, I've been honored to be your son. I'm also grateful to have my wife. What a great mom she is to our three and their families. She's a great mom and a great grandmother. Uh, I, I'm inspired by how she mothers what she does some of you can recognize this you, you would probably relate moms seems like that when she needs to buy for someone else in the family she could spare no expense but it seemed like when she goes to her she's arguing with herself whether I should get it or not but I'm, I'm telling you that's just her sacrificing way and her loving way and she's modeled what it means to be steadfast as a mom and I think that's the reason that we have three other great moms in our family and Stephanie and Mallory and Caitlin and we've got great children and grandchildren and I'm grateful for all of them today I want to speak to you about two moms today uh, one will be quite at length the other one will be kind of a sidebar but it's kind of interesting because their lives in the Bible are just the opposite the first one that I'm going to talk to you about in length they were almost obscurely overlooked but the one that I'm going to just talk a little bit about has been recognized by three different religions and so I want to talk to you about these two now this first one is a queen mother she's an Egyptian queen but what's interesting is is that we don't know her name the other is a queen mother she is the actual queen mother to the entire nation of Israel and will be for all generations and recognized as such as the founding mother I want to speak to her her name is Sarah we're going to talk about these two ladies just for a minute but we're we're not just talking just to moms but we are going to use these moms as examples of what happens when you make room for God like a mom. When you make room for God like a mom. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help me to speak your word. Lord, I pray, God, that you would give me grace today. Lord, touch me by your power. Let me be your vessel. Let me speak what you have to say and then move out of the way. And we give you praise and glory in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody say amen. All right, so an Egyptian queen who made room in her life for God to work and a Jewish woman who is considered the queen mother of all Israel. The first never gets her name mentioned. The second gets her name changed. The Egyptian 
queen I want to spend some time with you today. While the Bible does not give her name, only calls her the daughter of Pharaoh. We find that she has one of the most profound historical impacts on Israel and on us today. Her own adopted son would write the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, both the Hebrew and the Christian Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In all five of those books, nowhere will this writer mention his mom, his adopted mom, the queen, by her name. This woman had everything at her disposal. Riches, fame, luxuries that knew no limit. She was well-educated, she was respected and revered. She would in the future even have the opportunity to sit on Egypt's, on Egypt's throne one day for 22 years. And history will tell us that this woman, this, now folks, when you read the Bible, you're not reading fairy tale. You're reading truth, actual facts. History backs up, Egyptian history backs up that this woman for her 22-year reign had the most affluential and most impactful reign in all of Egypt in all of its time, but no name. She even, as she went on the throne, would rule and she would have great respect in the day and right now there are statues that have her likeness but no name. Yet there's one defining history-changing moment where she sacrificed all of this to make room for a little Jewish infant boy. She made room like a mom. This full story actually involves five mighty women who were used by God to ensure the redemption of Israel through Moses. One man put it like this, he said, Israel was the place through which all of mankind would get their redemption. And if it hadn't have been for Israel, there would be no story. But if it hadn't have been for Moses, there would be no Israel. But if it hadn't have been for this queen mother, the daughter of Pharaoh, there'd be no Moses. Let's look at these five women. First, two midwives. These two midwives, midwives would later be blessed by God to become moms. Their names, Shipra and Pua. One sister, by the way, who would never become a mom, her name is Miriam. One birth mother, her name, Jochebed. And one adoptive mother, a queen, who had no name that was written in the annals of the Bible. Jesus Christ out of Israel would be our great redeemer. Now let me just back kind of sidebar for a minute and tell you what it means that Jesus is our great redeemer. To redeem means to deliver from in its basic context. So Moses came and brought deliverance from Egypt. But Jesus came and brought deliverance from sin. Full redemption is not though just what you're delivered from but it's what you're delivered to. It's very important for us to have a place to go to. If we are just freed from our sin, then left on an island and without any hope, or without any future, what good is it? No, when Jesus set us free from sin, he set us free towards something else, eternal life. Now, let me just kind of full disclosure tell you that if you're wondering if I'm having trouble talking, I am. This week, I had the crown put on of an implant that I had had some time later, and it feels so big that my tongue wants to wrap around and pull it out while I'm talking. And I'm just, uh, so if I talk funny, just kind of go through it. I, I, I kind of have an issues. You can go ahead and laugh. It's okay. People laughed in the first audience as well. The prophet in Isaiah chapter 44 Put it like this. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. 
So that's God the King, and it's Jesus the Lord of hosts. They both say, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Moses took Israel to Canaan and the promised land. Jesus will take all who will receive him to heaven, that eternal land. But I want to give you this Egyptian queen story that started this whole inference of redemption. I want them to go to flash on the screen, Exodus chapter 1, beginning at verse 8. It says, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. First point, it should not be strange that we witness world leaders who do not know God. We should never be, and I know it's uncomfortable, we don't like it, it's an annoyance, but we should not be surprised that there are world leaders today that do not know God, do not follow after God, do not ascribe to his laws, and thereby we deal with the issues of sometimes godless nations. Many times the, the, this nation, the United States, have found themselves going against the God that they put on their currency. We shouldn't be surprised, though, it, it happened all throughout history. We find here that there was a man who did not know Pharaoh. He did not accept, or did not know Joseph. He did not accept the things of God. And so he said to his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Uh, with you and God, you are a majority. All right? Let's go on. Come on. Let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it came to pass that when there falleth out any war, they will join with our enemies, fight against us, and then they'll leave. They'll get out of the land. And now we won't have those people helping us do all of these things we like, don't want to do ourselves. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted Israel, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. In other words, they were disturbed. They were getting nervous now. It didn't seem. The more that they oppressed them, the more trouble that they placed them in, they were multiplying exponentially and they were becoming stronger and stronger as a nation that was under the rule of another. And the Egyptians... Go on to the next verse, 13. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. In other words, ruthlessly and terribly. It was a tragic thing to be in this era of time as an Israelite. All you knew was to get up and do back-breaking work, daylight to dark. Your family, your kids, didn't matter the age. They were absolutely oppressing them with work. And they made their lives bitter, the Bible says in verse 14, with hard bondage, in mortar and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service, wherein they made their service, was with rigor. Nobody had an easy life in Israel as an Israelite or as an Israelite. They were having it rough. And the king of Egypt then spake, to the Hebrew midwives, here's where we see these first two women, of which the name of one was Shifra and the name of the other Pua. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Now I want to stop and tell you, there is a tragedy here. That is a first of things that are going on and have been going on even today. That tragedy is the first nationwide sanctioned partial birth abortion. This is what you are now reading. Now, I know that this is graphic, but the Bible is not leaving anything out. When they got themselves in position to deliver a child, 
The law was when that baby presented itself and came from the birth canal, as soon as they found out that it was a male, those midwives were to destroy that baby at an instant. This was partial, partial birth abortion that was taken on throughout the nation. Now, let me just make this statement. When a nation or a people group decide that they are not going to serve God Jehovah, they will be enemies to the laws of God. God's law says there is sanctity in life. There is preciousness in life. But when people go against God and go against his ways, regardless of who they are, regardless of who they come from, when they go against God, then we find ourselves going against God's wishes and plans and laws. That's what was happening. You say, I cannot believe it happens today. Well, it wasn't the first time. But, everybody say but, except for the fact. That's what but means. Except for this fact, the midwives feared God. Moses, or Pharaoh, gave a command, but the midwives feared God. We ought to obey God rather than man. That does not mean we become rogue in the way we live our citizenship. But what it does say is that when it goes against biblical principles and God's laws, we've got to stand for what is righteous. These two midwives did that. They did not, as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men, children, and life. What that meant was is they let them live. And the king of Egypt now, he calls for the midwives and says to them, why have you done this thing and have saved and let all of these men, children live? Now, I got to stop and say that a lot of times I love it how God works. He gives deliverance, and sometimes he'll bring a little comedy with it. Okay. He'll have a little fun with it. How many has ever been delivered and God has set you through or brought you through or given you a breakthrough or whatever you want to call it, and you're rejoicing, you go back and look, and you get to laughing thinking, I can't believe God did it that way. I mean, that is incredible what he did. I would never have thought of that. Okay? Well, here we go. Why have you done this thing and saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, because the... Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are lively. In other words, they got some energy others don't have. There's something about their bodies that are a little bit different. And they got more uh, whatever they got. The Egyptians don't got. And they are delivering before the midwives come into them. I love how God works. All right. Pharaoh says, You're going to kill them all as they're being born. These two midwives go ahead and make the command to the other midwives because they got to say what the Pharaoh said. But let me tell you what happened. This is the best time in all of history for a woman to be pregnant. In the middle of the trouble, in the middle of the bondage, in the middle of the hard work and the oppression, of whom the women were not exempt either, okay? They were all working, and it was terrible. And now they're pregnant. And now they're thinking, oh, no, I know what the, what the edict has been around the nation. They are going to destroy my child. I don't know. What kind of child am I going to have? And now it's not of anxious enjoyment or celebration. It is fear. And, but here's the beauty. 
it said, before the midwives come, they stop dropping these kids around. <laughs> come on, mamas. No 18-hour, no 36-hour, no 48-hour. We ain't having all that, okay? Mallory had a similar experience with, was it Eden? Her third? I mean, it was like, we're going to go get something to eat. We're going to do this. We get here. No, the doctor don't even get to show up. We're having a baby, okay? <laughs> Can you imagine everybody? They're having babies. I mean, as soon as it, oh, I think, there he is. <laughs> okay, there she is. That'd be good. That's the comedy. Okay, Pharaoh's trying to do something, and God is making a way out of no way. Okay, that's the beautiful. Therefore, God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and waxed very mighty, mightily. Okay, listen to me. God wants to use you. Moms, God wants to use you. Okay? But let me tell you something. God does not use you and then go on to the next thing. He does not use you and forget you. He uses you and then he blesses you. That's his plan. That's always, sometimes you don't see the blessing in it until it's done. Can you imagine finding out you're pregnant knowing that within nine months your baby could be cut from you? Okay? But then imagine that you have this baby and before the midwives can ever get there to fuss about it or to tell on you, the baby's already here and you can hide it. That's what was happening. They were all multiplying. But God blessed them. Look at verse 21. And it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. Now, this did not mean he made them nice dwelling places, big houses. That's not what it's talking about. He made them their own families. In the midst of them delivering all of these children for everybody else, okay, God was giving them families of their own. God is interested in blessing. Everybody's joking. Can you imagine Israel laughing? Okay. Hey, the midwife comes. I thought you were, I come by here at eight months and you were pregnant. And I'm supposed to be here now to deliver this baby. What happened to you? We're good. Where's the baby? Don't, don't worry about that. We're good. Okay. All right. We're good. Now, everybody's rejoicing, but just because God gives you one victory does not mean the devil is not going to try another way to bring defeat in your life. Look at verse 22. And so Pharaoh charged all his people, every Egyptian, charged all his people saying, every son that is born of this Jewish tribe you will cast into the river. We know it's the Nile River. Cast into the river and every daughter you shall let live. Okay. The devil says if it didn't work this way, I'll try another way. Anybody ever had that fight with the devil? You ever had that type of battle with him? I mean, you got victory over here and he can't... He can't beat you on this one. He can't overcome you on this one. But all of a sudden, he tries something else. Okay. All right. Now, let's go to chapter 2, verse 1. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child. Everybody say, he was handsome. You ever, you know. <laughs> Every child is handsome. Every child is pretty. <laughs> All right. But this, amen. <laughs> but this baby <laughs> was a goodly child. She hit him three months. Now, I want you to know something. All of Egypt 
was given the command. Not only were they given command, but historians will say that they were actually getting rewards for pulling the Jewish children out of the homes, the men, the little baby child, the man child out of the home. And throwing it into the river. This is why it was having, she was having trouble hiding it. Why? Because the baby cries. People are looking through the window. I thought you were pregnant. What did you have a boy or a girl? Okay. They're going through all of this oppression. Okay. When she could no longer hide him, she took him for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and pitch and put the child in this boat and she laid it in the the flags by the river's brink. Mamas, it may be that you have to do the best you can do and build a boat and give them God. Do everything that you can. But then you may have to say, God, whatever you decide, I'm good with that. You have to give them up. His sister this was the one who later on, she's going to be on the other side of, uh, of, of the Red Sea. And she's going to have her tambourine in her hand. Oh, oh I've been hearing about some tambourines on some of these people, and I've been wondering about all that. Okay. Oh, what? Did you do something right there? You, you got a little portable tambourine. She don't even have to shake it. She just push a button. It just jingles. For, is that what it does? Oh, no, you got Okay, very good. I thought, I thought you was pushing a button. Okay, all right. right. She's rejoicing because Moses, her brother, the one who was in the little boat, he is now leading people through this sea on dry ground. And all of Pharaoh's armies are being swallowed up. And she's rejoicing. This is that Miriam. This is that Miriam also that would never have a child. Let me tell you something. I'm I'm going to speak to what people want to call the elephant in the room, but I want to speak with encouragement. Sometimes Mother's Days are hard for some ladies. They would love to have a child. It's not happened yet, or it's not happened at all. Or it may be somebody has lost a child. A mama has lost a child. Mother's Day touches a little different, okay? Feels a little different, okay? Listen to me. But let me tell you something. Know this. God has great design. Jeremiah 29 and 11 has it passed you over. God knows the thoughts he thinks towards you. Not of evil, not to do you harm, but to give you a good end. Okay? So let me tell you something. I don't know what's in the books for all of us. But I will tell you this. When this thing is said and done, it will always be for our good. You hold your head up because you're not half of anything. You're everything God wants you to be. Amen. 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 You're everything God wants you to be. Okay. His sister stood afar off. And she was looking to see what would be done. The daughter of Pharaoh came down. She began to take a bath. Somebody says it was a ritual bath from Egypt the Jewish people think differently they think she was on her way to conversion they think that she was actually in there trying to baptize herself trying to rid herself of the sins of Egypt and about to convert to Judaism she came to wash herself at the river and her maidens walked along by the riverside when she see how God works when she saw the ark among the flags she sent her maid to fetch it and when she had opened it she saw the child and behold the baby wept I mean who 
can deny a crying little baby. Okay. But that's not the reason. It wasn't because the baby cried. It's because I believe there was an aura in that little ark. I think there was a presence of the Holy Spirit. And there was the favor of God that was umbrella. And this woman sensed it. As a matter of fact, the Bible history will, will say that in this way of her conversion in the Jewish Bible, when she's making her conversion, she is recognizing that her father, who was the Pharaoh, is weakening the nation. And he is doing things that are not godly. And she begins to see that these people over here have something that is real. And she begins to desire that. Also, she knew that in order for her to be on the throne, she actually had to have a child of her own. She needed one. She had compassion and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. Now think about that. Somebody asked, why didn't she just pick up and adopt one of the Egyptian little boys? And then she could go on about her way. But it's because God had a plan. You don't have to know anything else, but God had a plan. Okay? This is one of the Hebrew children. Then said his sister, Yeah, you're right. It is a little Hebrew boy. Hey, should I go get a Hebrew woman so she can wet nurse? This little thing, because, you know, it might not work. Daughter of Pharaoh says, that's a good idea. And Pharaoh's daughter said, go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. Now, come on, mamas. This is going to be a time where you can shout. Pharaoh's daughter said, take this child away and nurse it for me. And I will pay you. Come on, mamas. You've been doing all this work all this time. How about getting paid for it? No, I'm not talking about, oh, I love you, mama. Make me a sandwich. Okay. No, I'm talking. Now she's getting paid to raise her own son. I'm going to tell you something. Don't ever limit God of what he can do. Sometimes we pray for just the minimum, and God just grins and goes, if you knew what I have in store for you. Okay. We, we almost afraid to ask him for what. No, no, enlarge our borders. No, 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 no. No, we can't. We can't. No, God said, look, talk all you want. I'm able to do, able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. The woman took the child and nursed it. History would tell you that was probably but three to five years. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter. Now come on, mamas. God's blessed. Gave you your child back. You got to nurse the baby. You're getting paid for it. You've been raising it three, four, five years. But you got to get it back. Not your son. This Egyptian queen has already took an adoption of it. She's been paying you for five years. You gotta get away. It's time. I'm gonna tell you something. I can't think of a good time to give away a child. But God has a plan. And are you okay with you having to release your child so that God can do greater things with your child than even you could? Go on. Put it all back on the screen. She brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. You go to the Hebrew Bible. They will say Moshe, M-O-S-H-E. You know what they're saying? They're saying, we want to give him a Hebrew name. 
We want to give him Moshe. But throughout the Bible, God says, I'm going to name him after the woman who was an Egyptian. I'm going to call him what she did. I just love how God works. I called his name Moses because I drew him out of the water. Mo is an Egyptian is, is water or river. Shea or, or, or S-E-S is to withdraw or to pull. I drew him out of the water. Now, I'm going to fast forward. I want them to go to Acts chapter 17 and we're going to read we're going to do Hebrews chapter 11 and then I'm going to close her part up and then I've got about two sentences for Sarah okay but when the time of the promise drew nigh which God had sworn to Abraham the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose which knew not Joseph the same dealt subtly subtly with our kind and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end that they might not live in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair he was a handsome child he was a handsome young man and nursed up in his father's house three months and when he was cast out put into the river Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nursed him for her own son and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. History will tell you that Moses was a statesman in Egypt, being a Jewish man. <laughs> he had favor. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. 35 years. This queen who had no name, who brought her son that she had pulled out and adopted and took care of him for 35 years. Now he's a man. We see that he desires to go find and be with his brethren and walks away from the palace. How do we know it? Put Hebrews chapter 11 up on the screen. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, listen to this, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused. Think about that. This woman invested 35 years. She protected him. He lived. He survived. She gave him everything. I mean, he was a statesman. Anything that he wanted was at his disposal. And she had loved him. And he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now listen to me. He was not rejecting her. My feeling is that he loved this Egyptian woman that had brought him out. And how many times had Miriam, his sister, or Jochebed, his mother, or Amram, his dad, told him about how that they pushed him down a river thinking that they'd never see him again. And within days, they had him back home. How many times did they say, you know what, that, that Egyptian queen, she took care of you well, and she did not withdraw you from us. You got the best of both worlds, son. You got all of the Egyptian wisdom, and we were able to teach you in the things of God. You got it all. He loved her. But what was the difference? He said he had an assignment. He was the Jewish leader to come. 
for all of Israel. So he had to walk away. Moms, listen. Let God lead your children. Let God lead them. Don't come up with your idea of how it's going to be. Let God lead your children. And be okay with however he wants to do it. And whether you're a birth mother or you're an adoptive mother, there comes a day when you're going to need to give them. I want you to stand. Why did he do that? Why did he do that? The next verse is that he chose rather to suffer the affliction with God's people than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Why? He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than all the treasures in Egypt for he had respect unto the day when God had for him something so much more Moses got more Israel got more because of Israel Jesus came and we got more and it's because a mother made room for more Sarah she's laughing She's 90. Her husband's a hunter. He's not doing a hunter. He's just a hunter. Okay? And God says, time's now. Abraham even went so far when God said, I am right now getting ready to start what I promised you. And your nation and your seed is going to multiply. You can hear Abraham say, oh, let it be so with Ishmael. He didn't get it. It wasn't Ishmael God was talking about. It was Isaac. She starts laughing. <laughs> Abraham says, let's have a baby. Funny, man. God, I'm sorry. It's funny. Isaac's born. She laughs again. She looks at him and she says, Can you? This is translated into my English. Can you believe that God allowed this 90 year old woman to give birth to Isaac? she laughed God changed her name Sarah meant or Sarah A meant she was a princess Sarah with an H with the H is a huh it's God's breath and because he put his breath into her her womb became alive and she became the queen mother of all the nations and Sarah means mother of generations so here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you, moms, let God be God in your children's life. I mean it. You've done well. You've not done perfect. My goodness, Sarah sure didn't. It's okay. But you've done the best you knew. And God says, I only lend them to you mine and will you today allow God to deliver your child by his hand by taking your hand off of it I'm going to ask every mom to come right and stand right in front here's different you are not going to face the stage I want you to turn around and I want you to go all along this aisle shoulder to shoulder and I want you to face the people I want you to come right come on wow wow look at this come on come on mamas Ooh, yeah come on look at them just keep on coming y'all might have to kind of go sideways instead of shoulder to shoulder we got come on come on go sideways scoot a little closer together act like you like each other okay 
let everybody get, I don't want anybody on the side. I want everybody somewhere. So scooch, or as we used to say, scooch. Okay, we got it. Come on. All right. We got some. Okay, look at it. They're, they're coming along that side. Hi, mamas. We see you. Make sure you pan and get to mamas. What did I tell you? This morning in the first service, there were 60 mothers. I need someone to start counting right now and give me a number real quick. Okay. 60 mothers. Okay. Huh? If, yeah, it, it, well, how many of you were here in the first service? Raise your hand because you're working. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, let's just say nine. Okay. So, Mike, subtract nine. Okay. We're not going to let them be double mothers. They said being one mom is enough. Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay. All right. I'm giving him time. This is important. 75 minus 9. Oh, 84 minus 9. 75. Oh, he did the math. Okay, yeah. I should have known. He's good at math. Uh, yeah, he went to... Praise the Lord. He's a pirate. Amen. Okay. All right. All right. Now, 75 plus 60. What's that, Mike? Okay. <laughs> you will think a lot. That is 24 more people in this room today than was mentioned in the entire Bible. 24 more women. And if we see all of what God did through those 111 women, can you just imagine what God's going to do right now in this one era of time with 135 of these ladies right here? Come on. Come on. But here's what I'm going to leave you with, mamas. Here's the altar call. Please, I'm begging you. Go forward. Go forward in your motherhood. You cannot change or do anything about the past. You cannot fix anything that might have not gone exactly right. But you are mama. You listen to me. When God said that is going to be Moses' mom, I'm going to say that the adopted mom is going to be the one that the name goes to. What was God saying? Doesn't matter what anybody else says. That's his mama. And it doesn't matter what any... Listen to me. Oh, I'm, I'm going to hit it right here. I feel the Holy Spirit. I, I, I feel it right now. I don't care what anybody says about your motherhood. Even... And I told, I'm, I use Beth, and I'll use her again as an example. It's hard for her here. It would not matter if one of my three children were to come and say, you are no longer my mother. It would not matter because God ordained it, and she is the queen mother of our home, and that will never change. It doesn't matter what anybody says. So I'm telling you, be mama. We have got to have you be mother right now. And be, oh, be okay. Look at your mama. Okay? God's going to take care of you. And welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. God's going to meet your need. Maybe this whole message was just for you. Okay? All right? I believe it's helped us all, but maybe God said, I needed you here today to let you know that what seems impossible with man is possible with God. All right, moms, last request. Ready? Love your children enough to give them completely to God. I mean it. You cannot do it alone. Give it. And when they see you next, love them like the gift that they are not how they're acting I mean they act a fool sometimes okay all right you want to strangle them sometimes but love them love them for how God made them 
Because they need you. Moses would not be here. And we would not be having an Israel. And Israel could not have given us a Savior. And the story would not have been told if it hadn't have been for a queen mama with no name. Okay? Heavenly Father, I thank you for these ladies. I thank you for the mothers who are watching online. Thank you for the mothers that were in the first service and all of those that maybe would be here, but maybe they went to be with their family somewhere else. God, I thank you for all of our moms. Lord, I just pray right now that you would take what you have given them and that they are so grateful for and they're so proud of. Lord, I pray, God, that you would bless them and give them the courage, the boldness, and the wisdom to return that child completely to you and be okay with whatever you want to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give our mamas a good hand.